Right, it's recording. Welcome every, everyone to Calvary Assembly. It's uh, good to be together today. And for those that are online and uh, have not been able to watch it uh, before and we're watching the recording afterwards, for you, I want to just tell you that we've been having a time of praise and worship and uh, you've missed it. I'm sorry about that. We can't put it onto YouTube with the praise and worship because they don't like it. They say that it's... Uh, copyright and so we start the recording now where we will welcome everyone to Calvary Assembly and we will continue with what I want to speak about this morning and uh, it will just hopefully obey me in a moment there we go as you see on the screen at the moment if you look at the screen behind me um, you see a picture of a fortress and uh, I want to speak today about fortresses in fact I'm going to speak uh, from Psalm 91, which is a favorite of so many of you. So many Christians around the world love the Psalm, uh, Psalm 91. And in one of the things that we learn from that Psalm is that he is my refuge and my fortress. And so we'll continue with that. And there you see a different picture of a different fortress of an even earlier time. And I think it's built with wood. Uh, it seems to be logs that are placed together. I wonder how they manage when they start shooting arrows with, with the fire on them and they can set the whole fort on fire. But you see, that's what used to happen in the old days. They used to have fortresses. And, uh, you know, I want to speak about that in the context of 2021. I mean, where we are today, uh, most of us in South Africa live in fortresses. You know, you, uh, if there's anybody here that doesn't have uh, burglar bars and burglar doors on your, your doors and windows, then I would love for you to tell me afterwards how you manage to sleep at night and are you happy to not have burglar bars. I think today when they build houses in South Africa, they automatically build burglar bars into them. And uh, it's, it's quite strange if you go to other countries now, we've traveled a little bit in different countries you're just passing through, but the countries that I've spent a bit of time in, uh, I think of Ireland and, and of England, uh, Germany, France, in each one of those we've spent a little bit of time. And uh, the strange thing is that none of them had burglar bars on their, house, on their door, windows. You know, you open a window and there's nothing there, you know, just the window. Sometimes in France, particularly, they used to have shutters, but the shutters not to keep people out, it's to keep the light out. You know, so that if people want to sleep when uh, in, the, in the summer, when the, the sun comes up late, uh, or rather it comes up very early and goes down late, they close the shutters so that they can have darkness inside. So here we are in South Africa with living in fortresses. Not only do we have uh, things on our doors and windows and all that sort of thing, but we most of us also have burglar, bar, burglar alarms. And, uh, you know, you set your burglar alarm when you're going out. And, and even at night, we set the burglar bar, uh, alarm and we just have one room that is bypassed so that we're safe in that room. And we've already had three break scenes. One of them was while we were in the room with the door locked and somebody got into the passageway and into the, the kitchen before the alarm went off. And then they ran away. And so we had to resort to putting uh, beams outside the house as well. So now we really are protected. And so I want to ask you today, are you protected? Do you feel protected? Do you feel safe when you go to sleep at night? And, uh, you know, that's the reason why they used to build walls around the cities in the old days, just to stop marauders and stop thieves coming in and, and, and people that wanted to take over their town. And so they would build walls around their cities to protect them. And that was their refuge. And so that's the prelim of what I want to speak about today. But you see, Psalm 91 and verse 2 says something very important. It says, I will say of the Lord, he is my fortress, he is my refuge and my fortress. My God in him I will trust. Now there's a fortress for you. There's a real fortress. And that's what I want to focus on just for a short while today. I don't think I'm going to make it too long, but I would like to ask you to focus on that, particularly that verse in Psalm 91 and verse 2. I will say of the Lord. You see, that's what the psalmist said. Do you say that? I will say of the Lord, he is my fortress. He is my refuge. 
He is my God, in him will I trust. Amen. So then we ask a question. If the Lord is your fortress, then where is the best place to live? The best location in the world. You know, you could go, let's say, anywhere in the world if you had the money to immigrate. And a lot of people are immigrating from one country to another. You know, some are going from South Africa to other countries. They feel safer if they go there. And then there's other people coming from other countries to South Africa. And they say, we have the most beautiful climate in the world. And we have so many positives here. Christians can go to church on a Sunday if they want to. Unfortunately, not many want to anymore. There used to be a day in South Africa where every single house on a Sunday morning, you'd see a car coming out with the whole family and off they would be going to church. That was South Africa. And it seems to be changing today. But where then is the best location in the world? Well, according to that psalm, the first verse of Psalm 91 tells us that he who dwells in the shelter or the secret place of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. So there you have the best place on earth to live. Dwell in the shelter or the secret place of the Most High, resting in the shadow of the Almighty. Hallelujah. That's where we have our residence, to be where God wants us to be. And then in Psalm 91, again, verses 9 and 10 says, if you make the most high your dwelling, there's a place to live. Make the most high your dwelling. We live in him and he in us. Even the Lord who is my refuge, then no harm will befall you. No disaster will come near your tent. Now that's such a comfort. You know, there are many Christians in South Africa and in fact around the world that read that psalm probably every day and just keep on claiming that and saying, Lord, you tell me, if I make you my most high dwelling, if I live in you and you live in me, then you are my refuge. No harm will befall me. It doesn't mean that there'll never be any troubles, that you'll have a trouble-free life, but we know that the Lord is with us in everything that happens in our lives. And that is absolutely vital for us to remember. So then, that's the best place to live. There was a man in the Old Testament by the name of Boaz who understood this concept of living in the Most High or making him your dwelling and your protection. In fact, when uh, Ruth came with um, Naomi from Moab, Ruth was a Moabitess, and she came with her mother-in-law after her husband died and, you know, the whole story. And they came into Israel and they had to find a place to find some food because, I mean, these two women had no income. And so uh, Ruth would go to the fields and go behind, like all the poorer people did, they were allowed to do it, go behind the harvesters as they harvested the grain. And they always made sure that they drop a bit on the ground. And that was never picked up. They, the gleaners, as they called them, the poorer people would come home, come after the, the, the uh, harvesters, and they would glean and get a little bit of grain that they would take home and have some food for the day. And so Ruth started to do this. Ruth was a particularly beautiful woman. And the owner of that farm, Boaz, took note of her. And immediately, I think he fell in love with her at first sight. But he was watching her carefully and seeing how diligent she was in work. And uh, he actually made a comment to her. And he said this. He said, uh, the Lord repay you for your work and a full reward be given to you by the Lord God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. So in other words, he understood this, the, the, the whole concept of the fact that they had come back to Israel and they were looking to God to be their refuge. And he understood this and he commended her for it. That's the best place or the best location we could possibly ever have while you are here on earth, to make your dwelling in the most high. Amen. I want to tell you a little story about a couple in America who retired. And uh, in the, around about 1980, 1981, they retired, but they were afraid at that time. I don't know if any of you remember that so far. During the Cold War, 
era between America and Russia mainly. There was many times that the Cold War nearly became a hot war. And this couple were particularly worried about that. They were afraid of a nuclear war. They didn't want to retire and spend the rest of their life in fear of the possibility of a war. And so they decided to move from the United States. They had the money to do so. So they traveled to different places in the world. They traveled and they studied to find the safest place on earth. That's where they wanted to retire. And they found such a place and they actually moved there. And uh, in 1981, they actually sent a Christmas card, the end of 1981, Christmas time, they sent a Christmas card to their old pastor, telling him of the new country they'd found and how happy they were and how peaceful it was and how wonderful that was for them. That was in 1981. Four months later, the Falkland Islands, which they had chosen as the safest place on earth, was invaded by Argentine troops. And there they were in the middle of a war zone on a little island. There was nowhere to move to. The whole island was overrun by Argentine troops. Argentina wanted this island, the Falkland Islands. They still want it. They, they feel that it's too close. It's close to them, but it belongs to Britain. But the thing is, all the people living there are from Britain. And uh, so there they were in the middle of a, uh, of a war. And you wonder to yourself, these were Christian people, praying people. Why did God let them move to the Falklands? Well, I can't actually answer that because they will have to answer that. Did they pray about going there? And if they did pray and God let them go there, there must have been a reason for them to be there. He would be with them through the war, and he was. And he would, must have wanted them there for a, for a reason of being a good witness for him. Whatever the reasons are, I don't know. But that's not the important thing to you and I. The important thing to you and I is that sometimes looking at things from a human perspective, no matter how strong your fair cakes are, no matter how far you see into the future, and you do your best, and you do all your homework like they did, they did, they did not get what they anticipated. Whether God wanted them to be there or not is between them and God. But from your perspective and mine, they didn't get what they anticipated, a peaceful situation. And you know, so often that will be the situation if your dwelling place is this earth. If you are a citizen of a country, South Africa, any other country, and that is where your safety is. That's where you trust you will be safe for the rest of your life. I'm sorry, you can never be sure that you will be safe for the rest of your life. All you can be sure of is that if your shelter is in that secret place of the Most High, if you are under the, at rest under the shadow of the Almighty, you can be sure of one thing. Through whatever difficulties you may have to face in the future, and you will face some, He will be with you. He is our shelter. He is our dwelling place. He is our refuge. Praise his holy name. So the place, of, place of, uh, safest place on earth for you to be is where God has placed you. You see, God places us in families. Now, I really feel sorry for people where the families have broken down. Marriages have broken down. Children have broken down. Uh, relationships with parents and parents with children and so on. And I'm sorry about that, but it's still God's best plan is for you to be in a family where there's a mom and a dad and children. That's God's best place for you to be. So sheltering in the secret place of the Most High, being under the shadow of the Almighty, and living in a proper Christian family is God's best place for you. And so the geography of where you live is not nearly as important as are you in a proper family? And you see, there's more to it than that. God also placed you in a church. And you see, the church is supposed to be your extended family. And so while we are family members of the whole church of Jesus Christ worldwide, within that whole structure of the church worldwide, God places a church in certain vicinities as well. The local church. And so the local church is your spiritual extended family. And so having said what we've said about geography, you don't have to move to the Falklands, but you can if you like. In fact, you can live anywhere in the world today because you can do your, your, your work on computers. Most people today 
live in one part of the, the town and the, the, the offices are somewhere else and they do the work and they don't have to go to the office. In, in fact, my, my grandson uh, got offered a job for an American company uh, in Dubai and he lives in Dubai, but uh, his company sent him on a business trip to uh, Saudi Arabia. And so now he traveled to Saudi Arabia and it's about a three week project that he had to do, but he was allowed to come home every few days and certainly for weekends and go back to Saudi Arabia. But while he was in Saudi Arabia, his wife got COVID-19, uh, granddaughter-in-law. And so now he couldn't go back there because if he went back there, he wouldn't be allowed back to finish his job in Saudi Arabia. So he had to stay in Saudi Arabia. It's amazing that you can do your job even though you're not anywhere near, not even in the same country. And he was able to continue doing his job. So what I'm trying to say to you is that we, the geography of where we are, where we live on the planet is not nearly as important as your spiritual existence and location. Your spiritual location is to be in a family, to be in a family of God, to be in relationship with God and make him the secret place of your dwelling under his shadow. Isn't that wonderful? That's where God wants us to be. And he gives us the ability to do so. We are in God's extended family. And in fact, Jesus said something about that extended family. He said, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you. There's nobody in the world that has loved you as much as Jesus loves you, not even your own mother. Jesus loves you completely. And he says to you and I, in the church, in the local church, you need to love one another as much as I love you, that you also love one another. That's the commandment from Jesus. And so there is a place of safety, is to be within the, the, uh, the, the, the covering of the love of the saints, to be in a in a lovely Christian family, in a beautiful Christian church, and to have that relationship with God where you say, you are my secret place. I live under the shadow of your wings. Praise be to God. There's the place to be. Galatians chapter 6 and verse 10, Paul says, Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all, but especially to those who are of the household of faith. So in other words, there's something special, even in God's eyes, when you have a proper relationship with your spiritual family, your, your physical family, but also your spiritual family. Do good to everybody, but particularly to the household of faith. So there is that understanding that we are to get from God. I understand there are people who are afraid to attend church. Maybe some of them are down right now. Maybe some of them are listening, but there are some that aren't listening. In every church, whenever we have a pastor's fraternal meeting, we, we have the same thing come up. Every pastor says, I don't know where all my people are. The people that used to be in our church. Some of them come online. Some of them come to church when we are allowed to take a certain number into the church. But there are a whole lot that don't come at all. We don't know what's happened to them. And all the churches are saying that. Well, they need to hear my next statement. And I can be quite sure that they will hear it because if they don't hear it from my lips because they're not online, they, how, do, how do I make sure they hear it then? By speaking to the Holy Spirit and asking him to show them Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 25. What does that say? Let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. And you see, beloved, that's the real question. Do you see the day approaching? You know, we, we, we take it as just a, something that the church has always anticipated. You, you see, the, they anticipated the coming of the Lord in, in Paul's days. They were anticipating in John when he was on Patmos. He expected the coming of the Lord any time soon. And in fact, he closed off the Bible by writing that, come, Lord Jesus. They, they were anticipating Jesus all over. And here we are 2,000 years later, and we're still anticipating. And you see, the scoffers will say, where is this Jesus that you always talk about? And there are scriptures that say, 
They will not always say it because it's going to happen. If God said it, it will happen. That settles it. If God said it, it will happen. And in the days of the coming of the Lord, we need all the more to gather together. And so whoever can hear me today, I say, please reconsider your involvement in coming to church. You see, even those that can't hear me today, Holy Spirit, show it to them. Because that's where we need to get ourselves ready for the coming of the Jesus. You see, it's not about the church and loving pastors loving to see a full congregation. It's not about the money that comes in. What's in our hearts when we say, beloved, you need to get ready for the coming of the Lord. And if we can't help you get ready, are you going to be ready? Are you going to be ready for the coming of the Lord? Because he's coming soon. Do you see the day approaching? All over the world today, people are seeing visions, dreaming dreams, and getting messages. And what are the messages? The time is drawing near. Jesus is coming. I heard a message only the day before yesterday for a lady, a black lady, who, who was putting across so emotionally the, the dream that God had given to her, a, a vision that she'd had. And then the Lord was saying to her, you've got to tell people because they are headed the wrong way. There are so many people that are lukewarm in their relationship with me. And she was pleading with people, get ready. The Lord is coming soon. And she was weeping as she was saying it. She was so filled with the, with the, 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 the burden that God had put upon her to tell people the time is nearly finished. Get ready. Jesus is coming. Now Satan will do his best to deceive you. He did that with Adam and Eve. And anything that God said, he came along and said, that's a lie. God didn't say that. Or God didn't mean that. Or God didn't know what he's talking or whatever he wanted to say. In, in essence, he said, she said, Eve said to him, the Lord said that if we eat this fruit, we will surely die. He said, you will not surely die. Contradicts God in every way he can. And that's what he will be doing right now about what I'm saying about the fact that Jesus is coming soon. He will do his best to say to you, there's plenty of time. Eat and drink and enjoy life. There's plenty of time in the future. Young people, there's plenty of time. One day when you're old, like, like Pastor Steve, then you can get your life right with Jesus. I want to tell you something. I've buried a lot of people that are a lot younger than myself. And the smallest was in a cloth of that size. Don't you be so sure that you've got plenty of time. Don't let Satan lie to you. But that's not all he'll lie to you about. He'll also lie to you about something else. That you're not good enough for heaven. Anybody ever had that? You're not good enough for heaven. And I'm sure that a lot of Christians feel, in fact, possibly all of us, that we're actually not good enough for heaven if it wasn't for God's grace, for God's mercy, for the fact that God says that if you are in Christ Jesus, he, he who knew no sin became sin for you so that we are becoming the, the, the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. He who knew no sin became sin for you so that you could become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. So Satan says you're not good enough. Well, I want to tell you something. Do you believe him? You see, when I first became a Christian, I went to Rudaput Assembly, Assemblies of God in Rudaput. And um, I heard a song one day, we sang a song one day, and I still believe that it is John Newton that wrote this hymn. But I can't find these words in any of John Newton's hymns in the hymn books we have available. I've looked for it and I've looked for it. But when we sang this verse, I immediately identified with it to such a degree that I memorized it. And I still have it in my memory today. And this is how it goes. Be thou my shield and hiding place, that sheltered by thy side, I may my fierce accuser face and tell him thou hast died. When Satan accuses me, 
to a loved one. Remind them that Jesus died for that sin. When Satan reminds me of how, what a rubbish I am, I said to him, Jesus died so that I could become the righteousness of God. If you don't memorize those words, beloved, get that principle into your life. Don't allow Satan to lie to you and tell you you're not good enough for heaven. And don't let him lie to you to say that there's plenty of time. I'm saying that the time is short. Now is the time. Now is the time. So where's the best place to live? In the shelter of the Most High. What about the best action? What is the best action for us to do then? Well, how should we live our lives? Well, Psalm 91 verse 13 says this. You will tread upon the lion and the cobra. You will trample the great lion and the serpent. That's what he says. Now, what does that mean to you? To me, it means being positive and not negative. It means aggressive in my action when I'm fighting against evil. When I'm fighting against Satan, I need to be positive and aggressive in the action. You know, I, I once heard, uh, I think more than once I heard it, but on, on television there was a group of, of priests who were trying to deliver somebody of a demon. And you know, they, they, they were actually pleading with the demon to come out of that person. And I want to tell you today, my friend, you don't plead with Satan. You don't plead with the demons. You take authority. Jesus said about the devil, the demon, the, the devil himself, that you can tell him, if you resist him, he has to run away. You can tell him to get out. You can tell him to leave. You do not Amen. have to let him take authority and have victory in your life. We may not be able to bind him because he's going to be around until Jesus locks him up for a thousand years. So you can't bind Satan. People who want to try and bind Satan will never do it. They'll never be able to because Satan is still going to be here through the tribulation. Satan is going to be here until Jesus locks him up at the beginning of the millennium. For a thousand years, he's going to be in jail. And then when he lets him out, he's going to put him into, into the, the, the lake of fire. So that's the future for, for, for Satan. You can't, you can't bind him. But there are certain things that the Bible gives us authority to take over Satan's works. We do not have to allow him to be victorious over us. You see, Jesus himself said, I tell you the truth. That means it's true. Do you get that? If Jesus says, I tell you the truth, it's actually true. And he says, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. You see, that applies to every work of Satan when he tries to tempt you, when he tries to attack you. Those are things that you can justifiably bind in the name of Jesus. He's given you the authority to do it. Why must we not take authority over evil? Why must we be subject? There are so many Christians that still have Things in their life that come from the flesh, from the old thing that they haven't been able to get victory over. And Jesus said, bind it. Bind it. You, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Loose the power of God into your life because you have the authority to do it. And then also Jesus said, again, I tell you that if two of you on earth agree about anything you ask for, it will be done for you by my Father in heaven. Hallelujah. Praise God. Two of us need to agree, and it's done. Praise the Lord. You see, so often when I start the service, you know how often I've done that. Quoted the second part of that verse, or the verse 20. For where two or three come together in my name, there I am with them. Jesus is here now in our midst. We are gathered in the name of Jesus, and that's where he is. So what's the best action we can do? Take authority over evil and live for the Lord Jesus. There's a story that I read about a Confederate soldier back in the days of the American Civil War. You had the Confederates in the South and uh, states that uh, wanted to keep slavery. And uh, that wasn't the only issue of the war. They also wanted to secede from the, from the Union. They didn't want to be part of the United States. They wanted to be on their own. Uh, like Texas wanted to be a country of Texas. And so this, the Confederates in the South 
were fighting over two basic issues. Number one, they didn't want to be part of the United States. Number two, they didn't want to get rid of slavery. And on those two issues, the Northern states all wanted to get rid of slavery and they wanted unity of the whole of the United States of America. They weren't allowed, uh, they weren't prepared to allow these states to go off on their own and just they almost like uh, KwaZulu Natal at one time wanted to become a country on its own and, and secede from South Africa. Today, there's a whole group working, working in the Western Cape. They, were, they want to get out of South Africa and call themselves a separate country. You see, they, they will not allow it, just as the United States wouldn't allow it. And the Northern Union forces were fighting against the Southern forces. And on this particular occasion, there were Christians in both sides. <laughs> you know, the Christians on both sides. You find that in every war. And, and on this particular night, there was a Confederate soldier who was who was a, a Christian, and he was put on guard, but in a place a little bit away from the camp, there were there was a wood, uh, a, a forest, and he had to go on guard close to the forest because that would be the most likely attack area for the for the uh, the opposition, the Union forces, and so he had to be there to give the warning quickly if he saw or heard anything in the woods, and while he was there. All of a sudden, I don't know if you've ever had this, it's almost like red ants clawing all over you. It's like your, your skin goes goose flesh. You suddenly know that there's something, there's some danger. And he had that, a sudden dread and fear overcame him. And being a Christian man, and being a singer, he decided the best thing he could do was just to quietly sing a chorus, not too loud so that he wouldn't wake up his, his uh, colleagues, the sleeping soldiers, but loud enough to be able to just comfort himself. And so he began to sing this chorus, Jesus, lover of my soul, let me to thy bosom fly. And then he sang the stanza, other refuge have I none. And as he sang that, he felt a sense of peace come over him, and he felt comforted. And so he got through the night, and went about to the rest of the war. And after the war was over, many, many years later, he was in a church, and he sang that same song. He sometimes used to sing a chorus, a singer solo, and he sang that song for the congregation. Jesus, lover of my soul, let me to thy bosom fly. Other refuge have I not. And so he sang that song. And after the service, a man came to him and said, I've never met you before, but I've heard you sing that song. I know that voice. I know that song. He said there was a patrol, and I was in charge of this patrol. And I was in Union forces coming through the woods. And we had six rifles pointed at you. And they were ready to fire on my command. When I heard that song, I gave this command to my men. Don't shoot that man. He knew it was a brother in the Lord. And so it protected him. Do you know the power of praising God? You see, sometimes we think when we come to church and we see a few choruses like this morning, do we realize what we are doing and the path that we are tapping into? Do you know that there is much power in the world? Nuclear power. There is much power. There's much power in evil, in Satan. But you as a Christian can tap into omnipotent power. The power of the Lord Jesus Christ. The power of the Father. The power of the Holy Spirit. Three personalities, but one God omnipotent. That's the power that you have at your disposal. No wonder Satan has to leave you. Praising and worshipping God has tremendous power. So what is the best action before I go to my last point? You see in Acts chapter 2 verses 42 to 47 it says there were, there were four things that the church was devoted to. They were devoted to, number one, the apostles' teaching. You see, the apostles taught from the Bible. 
So the apostles' teaching wasn't anything different to what you get coming from the pulpit in every church, which is a Bible-believing church. The apostles' teaching is a teaching of the church. They were devoted to them. The second thing they were devoted to was fellowship. In other words, they, they wanted to go to church. They were devoted to going to fellowship and fellowshipping with other Christians. So that was the second thing. The third thing was the breaking of bread, which we do every Sunday for that reason. We do it every Sunday because we believe that God wants us to do it. As often as you do this, you remember the Lord's death until he comes. The third thing they were um, devoted to. And then the fourth thing, prayer. Pray. You see, if you live your life devoted to those things, the teaching of the word of God, the fellowship of believers, the breaking of bread, remembering the Lord, remembering the Lord's death until he comes, and prayer. If you live your life in those three things, the best place to be is in the shadow of the Almighty, the secret place. That's the best place. The best action is to look for Jesus. Remember those four things I've just mentioned. And so we come to my final point. What is the best protection? Psalm 28, we'll come back to Psalm 91 in just a moment, verse 14. But in Psalm 28, verse 8, it says, The Lord is their strength, and he is the saving refuge of his anointed. The Lord is our refuge and our strength. Verse 14 of Psalm 91 says the same thing. Because he loves me. Do you love the Lord? I will rescue him. I will protect him. For he acknowledges my name. Oh, beloved, I don't know how many times I pray to God and I said, Lord, I don't love you enough. Do you obey the first commandment that you love God with all your heart and soul and mind and strength? Are you satisfied you love him enough to do everything he tells you to do? Many times I've prayed that prayer and I pray it again even today. Lord, help me to love you more. Because you love me much more than I love you. And I want to love God more. And he says, because you love me, I will rescue you. I will protect you. For you acknowledge my name. And then the next, next verse he says, he will call on me and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life will I satisfy him. And show him my salvation. Hallelujah. That's the best protection we can ever get. You know how wonderful it is that the, you know, the protection of God is just so incredible. There was a there was a story in the National Geographic a number of years ago uh, about the Yellowstone National Park. The Yellowstone National Park is world famous. It's like the Kruger National Park uh, in South Africa, world famous. And the Yellowstone National Park. They had a huge fire on one occasion. And after the fire, one of the rangers or a group of rangers were walking along and they came across a tree. And next to the tree was a bird that was lying dead, flat on the ground, wings out, absolutely petrified and dirt, dead, burnt to, to cinders. And he took his staff and he just kicked it away. And under that bird were three live chicks. That bird could have flown away and not be caught in that fire. But she decided to give her life up for her chicks. That's what she decided. Oh, God. Jesus chose to die for me and for you. Psalm 91 verse 4 says, He shall cover you with his feathers. And under his wings you shall take refuge. His truth or his faithfulness shall be your shield and buckler or your rampart. That's what it says. Psalm 91 verse 2, very important. I say of the Lord, he is my refuge. He is my fortress. My God in him I will trust. That was our first verse that I brought up on the screen this morning. And yet there's so much trouble in the world. You know this trouble. Look at the trouble. The world's in so much trouble right now. 
you, we think the, the COVID-19 is the biggest problem. The biggest problem lies ahead of us. It's going to be financial. Do you know how they are killing the finances of the world with the lockdown everywhere? There's so much trouble in the world. Don't you sometimes wish it would all end? Jesus, won't you come and fetch us? Revelation 22, verse 20. It's almost as though John was saying the same thing. He said, he who testifies to these things says, Jesus, yes, I'm coming soon. And John says, amen. Come, Lord Jesus. And then the final word this in your Bible is the grace of the Lord Jesus. Be with God's people. Amen. That's how your Bible ends. You can see the heart of John expecting the Lord to come in. And the message that comes from him is the same message that comes from Jesus. And Jesus said it. He said it in uh, Luke chapter 12 and verse 40. He said, you also must be ready because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect it. And so his message is, be ready. Be ready. Are you ready? I want to close with a few thoughts from Charles Hatton Spurgeon. When he was studying cities of refuge, you know, when, when the Jews came out of the wilderness into the promised land, Joshua was given a strategy by God of how he would divide up the land and how he would conquer the Philistines and, and how he would then be able to position the different tribes in, in certain areas. And all that information was given to Joshua as the leader. And then God said, now there's something else we want to give you. You must make six cities of refuge. Now, what is the city of refuge all about? You see, there's no question about the law. The law says if you murder someone, you must be put to death. That's the law. You murder someone, you must be put to death. The angel, or not the angel, the, the avenger of blood would kill you. But now the Lord said, if there is someone who kills another person by accident, and not by malice or forethought, by accident, then that person must have a place they can run to, which will be a city of refuge. And so the cities of refuge have to be placed strategically around the, 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 the towns where this person could run to. And then the elders of the town would examine him and listen to his story. And they would decide whether he was in fact, did not do this with malice or forethought. And if they felt that he was, he was honest and needed to have a, a, a trial, in other words, to be set aside, then they would protect him from the avenger of blood. And these cities, a study was done by Charles Spurgeon about that. And I want to just give you four or five little quick points in closing. The first one is that they had to be a short distance from wherever you lived in Israel. It couldn't be too far away. You had to be able to get there before the avenger of blood got to you. You had to be able to get away. So it would never be so far away that he would catch up with you. Short distances. And as Charles Burton said, doesn't that talk to you about Jesus? He's never far away. He's always there, available for you for salvation for protection, for fellowship, for everything. Jesus is always near to you. He's never far away. The second thing is that the roads had to be maintained and in good condition. There couldn't be rivers that would sometimes get in flood and you wouldn't be able to cross the river. There had to be bridges over the rivers and the, place, the, the, the roads to the city of refuge had to be looked after and maintained so that you could get there quickly, not so many potholes like Nelspeg, but now you need a four by four in Nelspeg. I know now why people, or so many people buy four by fours. You need them in Nelspeg, you know, even on the Todd roads. But you see, it wasn't like that. To get to the city of refuge, you had to be able to get there 
quickly. So the roads had to be maintained. Isn't the gospel just like that? It is so easy and simple with no stumbling blocks, no potholes, no rivers to cross. Come to Jesus. Close to you. Easy to get to. You call upon him and he's there. The third thing, the signposts. Apparently they had to have signposts to the city of refuge so that you knew exactly where to go to. If you were guilty or you had killed somebody without meaning to do it and you wanted to get away from this avenger of blood, you could see the signposts and, and you could get there. And isn't that just like salvation? The road to Jesus is straight. No detours, no roundabouts, just believe and live. Hallelujah. And the fourth thing about this cities of refuge, even if you got into the suburbs, you didn't have to get into the city center. As soon as you got into the suburbs, you were saying, the elders would come out and they would talk to you. And if they felt you were an honorable person, they would protect you from the avenger of blood. Even if he was right on your tail, they would protect you and see to it that you got a fair trial. You don't have to be so close to Jesus that you can actually have him touch you with his hand. Remember the woman with the show of blood? All she had to do is touch his garment. We can pray for each other right now. The Bible says we should anoint with oil and we should lay our hands on each other. But now the law says that we have to distance ourselves. Do you think there's any less power if I pray for you when you're sitting right now? The omnipotent power of God is at work when we pray in the name of Jesus. Beloved, you don't have to be, you can be in the suburbs, so to speak. We can be distanced from each other. But to touch his garment is sufficient for healing. There's one exception. You see, if a person really killed somebody with malice or awkward, then the road was not available to him. He would have to make other arrangements. He'd run from the avenger. He'd try and hide away in the woods. He would go anywhere except to the city of refuge because he knew in the city of refuge he would be questioned to see if he was really honorable or not. And so a person who's self-righteous will find that he has a, a great problem with this easy road to Jesus. This closeness of Jesus is not available to the person who says, I haven't sinned. Why should I go to hell? To the person who is self-righteous, who lives such a good life that he thinks he can get to heaven on his own, like the people who try to build a Tower of Babel all the way to heaven. You, if you have that attitude, there's no road to the city of refuge for you. That's the one exception. So too, come into Christ. We come in humility. And I close with this. He is my refuge, my fortress, my refuge, my God, in him I will trust. And so we come to you humbly, Father, in the name of Jesus. We lay our dives down again before you, and we thank you for the fact that we can live in you, that we can make you our dwelling place. Thank you that you show us in the church is the way to conduct our lives, how we act. And thank you for the protection that you give to us. Oh, Father, we are a blessed people indeed. And I pray now for every person who hears this talk, whether it is uh, even uh, in the future, uh, as it goes on YouTube and on the on, on the, on the on the website Father I commit it to you that every person who hears it will get that one thought into their minds that I can go to Jesus I can get to the Father I can get to the city of refuge through Jesus he is my way, my truth my life, he's the road that takes me to eternal life help people to come to that realization I pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.
as we come near to a close, I remind you about the tithes and offerings. We don't send the bag around, but there are boxes at the back for those that want to put something into it. So please remember the tithes and offerings is a, a great thing. And I would like to just close by making this blessing to you. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. 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 Thank you, Jesus.